All right, let's get started. So welcome to Data 8 Lecture 12. We're, about, we're entering the second half of our two-hour lecture. I'm going to try to end early. We'll see how it goes. And the content for the second half is definitely not as heavy as the content for the first half. Hopefully, it's more enjoyable for you guys. In fact, I hope this is more enjoyable because we're going to be talking. I'm going to be introducing Project One to you. Okay? So there's this guy named Hans Rosling, and he was a very famous statistician. He was very interested in looking at global trends. Okay? And in Project One, we're going to take his data and kind of do some analysis on it and see if we can get the same conclusions that he did. Let me show you the first couple of minutes of his BBC special. Uh, let me dim the lights. Um, let's see, theater. Let's do that. Let's see, how does that look? Snazzy, okay. I hope you guys can hear this. We live in a world of relentless change. Huge migrations of people to new mega cities. Things soaring skyscrapers and vast slums. For fuel and there we go. unpredictable climate change. And this in a world where the population is still growing. Should we be worried? Should we be scared? How to make sense of it? Seven billion people live on this planet alone. Isn't it? People think about the world and the future. They panic. Others prepare to think about it at all. But tonight, I'm going to show you how things really are. My name is Hans Brooks. I'm a statistician. No, 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 no. Don't switch off. Because with the latest data from World Cup, I'm going to show you the world in a new way. I'm going to tell you how world population is changing and what today's data tell us about how the future is going to be. Undeniably face huge challenges. But the good news is that the future may not be quite as good and that mankind already is doing better than many of you think. All right, don't panic. Don't panic about Project One either. Cool. So lights back on. Let's continue. I'm going to introduce one more table method, and it's called joining. Okay. It's not as complicated as the other methods that we talked about today, hopefully. So I hope you guys will. I hope you guys will feel good about this one. So let's suppose I have two tables. Okay. I like to get drinks around the north side, around this area. If you have not looked, walked around this area and gotten drinks here or food here, I would recommend it. Food here is quite good. In particular, I like to go to these places. I like to get milk tea from T1, which is unfortunately closed over the summer. I like to get espresso from the Feli, latte from the Feli, and espresso from Abe's. Okay. And it turns out that these places have discounts. Okay. So I get a discount, 25% T1, amazing. 50% off from the Feli, even more amazing, and 5% from Team 1. So I have a couple of coupons. Let's suppose that I want to know how much discount I can get for each drink. Okay? To do that, if I have these two tables, what I need to do is have some way of combining the two tables. The way to do that is with the join. Okay? So I would call, call drinks.join, and I would say join on my cafe column using the location column of my other table and put that together into a new table. And I get back, if I did this line of code here, what I get back is these, a table containing these three rows. So in the Feli, I get espresso with 50% off coupon. I get a latte with 50% off. And at T1, I get 25% off from milk tea. Okay? So the way that this works is when I call dot join, I'm going to say keep all the rows in my table that have a match. So what I'm saying is, look at the cafe, look at the location, and keep only the rows that have a matching one. That's why Abe's, unfortunately, is, is gone from my resulting table. No Abe's in my discount, so there's no match, no join. Okay? 
for a value in my cafe column, in my discounts table, location column. That's how the syntax works. Right here, I get back, so you notice I have four columns in this table. That's because the cafe column matched up with the location column, so I, I get rid of, so those two columns kind of combine into one column. And then the coupon column was the remaining column, and that gets kind of attached to my table here. So I have four columns in my final table because my location column got merged in with my cafe column. Okay. Abe's is gone. And how this works is you notice that there are two T1s, two T1 coupons. Only the first match in this table is used when I join together. So you notice I got 25% T1. If this unfortunately, if this row had unfortunately appeared before my 25% in T1, I would have only gotten 25, I will I would have only gotten 5% off at T1. Okay, so only the first match is used for a join. And right here, you'll notice that this join column is sorted automatically. Okay. So what Python does is when I do a join, it goes to this table, takes the first row, says, okay, look for many matches. Ha, ah, here's a match. Put that in my new table. Go through the next row. Is there any matches? Ah, yes, here's a match, put that in my new table. Here's a match, put that in. No match, don't put it in. So I have three rows left, and every row contains the four columns because I joined the two tables together. <coughs> cool? You have a question, Sean? Yeah. Sorry? First matches are the only ones that are shown. Like, it seems very problematic. Yeah, so Sean says, this seems likely to result in some problems, and in fact, it does. So usually when you join, you want to kind of make sure that you don't have like duplicate guys here. Yeah. So usually you don't, wanna, you don't actually want to join on something like this. What you want to do is you'd want to probably group by location first, and then take the max coupon. Then you can do a join safely without worrying about that duplication error. Good question. All right, so let me show you an example. It'll be quick, hopefully. Oh. Yes. Do you have a question? No question. All right. Let's do a demo. OK. Here we go. So run that. Here are my drinks. Here are my discounts. And as promised, I can do drinks. Dot, oh, drunk. No. Drinks.join cafe discount on the location column. So I pass in the column in my first table, pass in my second table here and then pass in the label of my third column. And I get cafe drink price, and as promised, 50% off at Nathalie. What a deal. Okay. I can now take this table. So let's call this the table T. And now I can take this table and find out the resulting price of each drink. So I can take T dot column price, and then divide it by times 1 minus t dot column. I'm going to say column number 3. So what that will do is I'm going to take, like, I'm going to find the resulting price of each one. So to find out how much remaining price I have, I'll do, like, 1 minus 100 minus that, and then divide that whole thing by 100. OK? So I get back here. The new price of espresso and the Nefeli after the coupon is $1. New price of latte is $1.5. New price of milk tea is three dollars. Okay, so then I can do I can add that to my column, add that to my table. Sorry, like new tea dot with column, um, new price or discounted, and do that, and now I have my discounted price in my table. Find my discounted price. Cool. Let me take attendance now. So congratulations. Here we go, record down attendance. And I believe it is open. Go ahead and take attendance. So now I'm going to work with one of my favorite data sets in this class because I love biking, and this data set is about biking. Okay, so go ahead and do that. So this data set right here is a list of bike trips. Okay. So in San Francisco and in the Bay Area, there's a company called SF Bike Share, I believe. Have any, have any of you guys seen those bikes around in San Francisco, like the blue bikes where you kind of like 
where you can kind of rent them out and then bike somewhere and then put it back in the stand. What you can do there is basically just like pay, pay your membership fee. And if you bike somewhere and your bike trip is under 30 minutes, I believe, your bike trip is free. So you only pay a membership fee and you can just bike to where you want to in 30 minutes. What they did, that company, is they recorded down all the different starting and end points for every trip that was made. And, what, and they gave us that data. And so let's take a look at what that data can tell us. So I have here this big table. This table contains the trip ID, duration, where the, the start time, start station, start terminal, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. A lot of data here. And you'll notice, if I scroll down, that there are 350,000 rows in my table. Okay, so now we're starting to work with data that is way too big for Excel or some other like stand. You can't upload this into Google Sheets because it'll probably just complain about it being too big, you have a bad time working with this. Okay, so Python lets us work with this kind of data, no problem. So here I have 300,000 rows in my table. Let's take a look at what's inside here. Okay, so let's try. So here we have a duration here. This duration is in seconds. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I sort by duration, maybe I'm curious as to what the most time consuming bike trips were. Sort by that, well, it looks like there's this guy here that has a duration of like what, like 17 million seconds. So if I divide that by 60, that's like, so if I take that and divide it by 60, I get back uh, like 200,000 minutes, divide another 60, 4,000 hours, divide by another 24, 200 days of trip. Okay, this bike was probably stolen. So this bike was probably stolen. <laughs> But most trips in here are short because of the 30 minute like free bike trip kind of deal. So most of them are in here are kind of short. I can show you the distribution of durations. So let's take the trips.hist. And let's take a histogram of the duration. And I see here that because of, because of these really far out guys out here, the histogram is just like one bar here and then like one or two guys out here. Let's get rid of the guys on top. So let's take Let's get rid of, let's do where duration are below. And let's say below like the 30 minute mark. So below the 30 minute second. So this is like number of seconds in 30 minutes. And then let's histogram them. So now I see, okay, so it looks like most trips were under like 30 minutes. And most of them, in fact, were in this range right here, which is perhaps I can use more detail. So let's take that. Let's take that. And let me say, let's add more bins. So more, let's say 60 bins. And I want to say the units are seconds. OK, so here we go. Units in seconds. And now I see, OK, it looks like most of the chips happen within like maybe like 250 to, to maybe like 600. So most trips were under about like 10 minutes. So in this kind of 10 minute range right here, short trips. All right. Now, yes, Kevin. Uh, would, it be would it be correct to call this curve right skewed? Would it be correct to call this curve right skewed? Yeah, you you could call it like right tailed or whatever, but you don't have to really have to give a name for it. You can just look at it and say, oh, it looks like it's sloping down to the right. Yeah. Cool. So now that I have this, let me show you the bikes table again. Commute. Ah, I see. So what I'm going to do first. Sorry, I'm going to save that, save this table as a table called commute equals that, because I'm going to look at commute. So most people take these bikes on their way to work, like commuting to work. They bike a 30-minute trip to work, bike a 30-minute trip back. It's a commute. So here's my commute table. Okay, so that's pretty long. Let's, let's uh, use show to make it shorter. So here's commute.show, maybe just the first two rows, first two rows. Okay. Now, please take a look at the following code. Start station and talk over with your neighbor what this code does. All right, any takers? What does this code do? I would like another volunteer. 
Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So right here, I'm going to compute. So I'm going to group by star station. So here's my station. And then I'm going to find out. So when I group without any additional things here, it just counts up how many times your station appears. And I'm going to sort by that count. So I can find out the most popular starting points. Run that. And I, it'll take its time, because I got 300,000 rows. But when it's done, I should see here. So the most popular station starting was San Francisco Caltrain, Town Center Fourth, and there was another Caltrain station, and then Ferry Building, Howard at Beale, et cetera. Okay, so the most popular start places. All right, so let's call this. So I don't need this table. Okay, so there's a group. I can also do commute dot pivot start station end station. What will this do? Think about that for a moment. All right, I'm going to cut you short and just run it. So I'm going to run it. It's going to take a sweet time. And what I get is. For every start, so every star station is here, every end station is here, I get how many trips there were between each star and end station. Right? How many times like the star and end pair appear in my table. So now I can see, oh, OK, so a lot of trips from 2nd and Townsend to 2nd and Folsom. There are no trips from Adobe on Almaden to 2nd and Folsom. Why might that be the case? Well, if you look at where Adobe on Almaden is, it's actually in San Jose. It's kind of hard to get from San Jose to San Francisco in 30 minutes. It'll take you more like six hours. So not in my table. OK, cool. So let's take a look at the durations of my trips. So I got here, trips.select. If I grab three, six, and one, oops, I have here star station, end station, how long each trip was. Okay. Let's say I want to take a look at the shortest trips. So what I, what I can do there is I can take duration. Let's call this table duration. Duration, here it is. Duration dot group. Let's say I group by the first column, second column, and I take the min. What will I compute here? Talk over for one minute. Yeah, one minute. Oh, yep. Whoops. Duration, duration of trip. All right. So I run it, and what do I get? So what I'm doing here is as I'm grouping every unique start and end station pair, I'm going to take every unique start and end station pair, look at all durations between those two stations, and then take the minimum of all those durations. So what do I get back? I get back for every star station and every end station how long your shortest trip was. So it looks like, OK, so someone went from 2nd and Folsom to 2nd and Folsom in one minute. Great. Good job. Someone from 2nd and Folsom to 2nd and South Park in only one minute. So those two stations probably are very close together. On the other hand, 2nd and Folsom to Davis and Jackson, the shortest trip, even for a biker that was going like blazingly fast, was still like five, six minutes. Okay, so those, those two stations are a little bit farther apart. So you can kind of see we can use a minimum duration to kind of see like about how far apart each station is. Okay. So now let's take a look at, let's suppose I'm interested in a particular station. Let's suppose I'm particularly interested in the Civic Center BART station. So let's take this. Let me call this shortest. Okay. And let's take my shortest table and look at where the first column, where the start station is cont contains the string civic 
center bar. How many of you guys have been to the Civic Center Bart? Been to the Civic Center Bart? If you haven't been, you should check it out. It's kind of nice. Okay, so Civic Center Bart Station. And let's sort by the duration. Okay, so sort by duration. So it looks like here I only have where trip, I only have trips that start at the Civic Center BART. And it looks like, again, someone started there, ended there, biked around in a circle for one minute and then came back. Big deal. But then it looks like, OK, so the Powell Street BART station is like 1.3 minutes away. Mark at 10th is the next closest. Okay, so I can get a sense of how far, how far things are away, are away from the Civic Center BART. But I would really like, so this gives me a sense of how far away stations are from each other. But in reality, like, I would actually want to know where the stations are, right? I actually want to know, like, okay, like here's a map, here's a station, here's how far away each, each station is from each other. So I'm going to show you something cool, which is that we can actually do that. I'm going to code attendance. Is anyone still taking attendance? Excellent. Close that. I will show you how to draw a map. Okay. The way maps work is. Blah, blah, blah. You know what? I'll just show you. I don't know. I'll just show you, and then you can look at the description of it. Okay. So I have here, from the same website, I have taken the data of all the stations. Okay. So I have here the stations. I have here the latitudes and longitudes. And when I have latitudes and longitudes, I can identify where they are on the globe. So I have this, and I can draw the map by typing marker, a map table. And take my stations table. The way this method works is the table has to look a certain way. I'm going to tell you how that. I'm going to tell you what the format of that is in a second. But for now, just know that I'm going to take out the latitude column, the longitude column, and the name of the station. And very cool. So I have here a map of the Bay Area. Every marker is one station in my original data set. So I can see here. I have a bunch of stuff here. Let's take a look at this region here. So this station right here is a Stanford, I mean, uh, Franklin and Maple Station. Uh, if I go up here, um, I have here the Civic Center BART Station. Okay, so I have here the Civic Center BART Station. We can take a look. Take a look at where stuff was. Okay, so I have here Civic Center BART. Looks like Powell Street Bar Station was the next closest in 1.3 minutes. So it's probably, let's say, that one. Powell Street Bar is indeed the closest. Take a look at the next one. Market at 10th. Market at 10th. Let's see, this one. There it is. Okay. So these two are the closest, fastest trips going from place to place. <laughs> yeah. So Kevin wants to know how does this magical function draw this table? Well, wouldn't you like to know? Would you, are you asking like how to use it or how it works behind the scenes? How to use it? Well, that's a great question, which leads right into my next slide. Okay. So the way a map table works is you need to give it a table. It's a function that takes in a table. A table needs to have columns in a specific order. Okay. The order is not too complicated. The way it works is you can use, so I use a marker on map table. I get these little like blue markers. You can use this thing called circle, which draws circles. I'm going to show you how that works in a second. So either marker or circle, the map table, you pass in the table. And this table needs to have latitudes in the first column, longitudes in the second, labels in my column two. And then after that, these two columns are, I believe these three columns are all optional. So colors, if I had like a column of colors and I wanted to color each marker differently, I can use colors. If I wanted to make each marker a different size, I can also say which size each marker should be. But as for a basic usage, latitudes, longitudes, and labels, that's what I did in my example there. Okay, so marker on map table, and give it a table. Cool. Let's take a look at some more maps, because those seem to have gotten your attention. A map, let's use circle. Okay, so I'm gonna grab, so if I look at my stations table, You'll notice that for every station, I also have like a landmark, which is kind of like the city that the station is closest to. Let's grab all the, all the stations in San Francisco. So I only have San Francisco stations. I'm going to call this SF. And what I'm going to do now is use circle instead of marker. and use map table, map table. And I have to make sure my table has the right column, so I'm going to select out the latitude, the longitude, and the name. 
Now I can do more things, which is say, OK, color these markers green, and make the radius, so the size of the circles, to be 150. And now I can see the stations in San Francisco using green circle markers with a certain radius. This radius is pretty arbitrary. Just know that if you make it bigger, you can usually just adjust it to be bigger or smaller depending on how big your circles want. So here again, say we send our BART. Okay. Cool. So let's take a look at oops. Let's take a look at this table again. So I've done the ones containing service center BART. Let's call this CC. Okay, so I have my CC table. <clears throat> Now, I mentioned before you can use colors in a table. So what I can do is take a look at my stations. And let's say I want to color the different stations in different like, regions of the Bay Area differently. So as I want San Jose markers to be one color, San Francisco markers to be another color. How would I do that? I can group by a landmark. So I have here the five different landmarks. Then I can add a color to each landmark. So with column, color, color, sorry. And let's make mountain view markers blue, um, Palo Alto markers red, Redwood City markers green, San Francisco markers orange, orange. Orange. And San Jose markers uh, purple. So I have landmarks with the color for each landmark. How can I get these colors back into my original stations table? Well, I have two tables. If I want to combine two tables, I want to use a join. Okay, So join. Take this and call it colors. There's my colors table. I can take my stations table and join it with, I want to take my stations table. Let me take a look. Take the landmark column, match them together, and take the color for each landmark. Okay, So join landmark with my stations table. Now, if the, two, if the two tables happen to have the same column name in both matching columns, I can omit the third argument here. So I can do this and do join and get back. If you look here, uh, landmark. Where's my color? Oh, whoops, I joined it with this self. Join with colors. Here we go. I have the landmark and the color. I can also just leave it out because the colors and the stations table both have the landmark column. Remove that. It's the same thing. It's a little shorthand. So now I have landmarks and colors. Let me draw this map again. So oh, that went somewhere far. OK, so I'm going to take this. And I'm going to call this table colored. And I'm going to use display that colored. I'm going to use circle, or sorry, map marker, and I'll map table colored. And I'm going to select out again latitude, longitude, name. And then now I can select out the fourth column, which is color. So color.select that long. Name and color. And now we can see that the markers here are green, markers here are red. I can now I now have like color coded landmarks. Pretty sweet. Okay? Yes. So this one just looks great. Like since we have a lot of arguments. What how is the invalid values for a color will like what color Yeah, so Kevin notes that this, this specific method has very specific like requirements for the thing you pass in. He's wondering what happens if I were to just make up a color here and call it like ASDF or like hello world or something. Well, you can find out for yourself. All you have to do is try it out. <laughs> yes, Sean. Yeah, that's a good question. So Sean asks, can I use colors? So I use colors here for like kind of the like grouping location. Can I use colors to indicate other things? In fact, you can. I actually just chose here when I did the grouping and construction of those tables which items I wanted to be which colors. 
If you construct the tables your own way, you can color anything you want any way you want. The world is your oyster. Okay. Let me show you another way to indicate something on a map, which is to use the size of the marker. Okay. So I'm going to take my station starts. So stations. And I believe I have a table called starts. That's not defined. Uh oh. Did I forget to name a table? <clears throat> Confused. Station starts. Ah, okay, so I forgot to make this table a long time ago. So again, if I do my commute dot group, start station, I was supposed to name this to starts. I forgot to do that. Now I have a starts table. Okay, wait for that to go. Let's go down to the bottom. So I have stations, I have starts. And so what this says, again, is the most popular or ordered in descending order all my starting stations and how many trips there were for each station. What if I can make a marker for every station, making it bigger if there are more people starting a trip from that station? Okay? So I'm going to take that. And what I do is I have this table of latitudes and longitudes, but I want to use the count here as something in my, mark, in my map. So I'm going to join them together again. So stations, join. And I, want to, I want to join on the name. Got my notes, name, parts. And I want to join on the start station column of my starts table. Here we go, another join. So every station, I have how many trips there are starting from that station. Okay, so I have here 7,000 trips starting from second and full seven. All right, so now I can take a circle. Or here we go. So I'm going to take this table. I'm going to call it uh, station starts. Oops. Station starts. There we go. Take that table. I'm going to change it into a table that has a format I can use for circle from that table. Station starts. Select. Grab out my latitude, which I believe is that longitude, and name. But here I have the three columns. Now I can grab, I want to add another column, which says color them all blue. So let's add some columns. So here I want the color to be blue. And I want the area of that marker to be the size of that, to be the count, so that column count. I want to scale it up because by default, I'll make the markers too small. I want to make them, let's say, size 1,000. Okay? So what I have here is a table. I have latitude, longitude, name, color of the marker, and the area, the size of that marker on my map. I can pass that in to, I'm going to call this ready to map. Ready to map. Pass that in to circle. Map table, ready to map. And here we go. So now you'll see markers for every station. The size of the marker is bigger if there are more people starting a trip from that station. So Mountain View has lots of starts, San Jose lots of starts. And San Francisco, if you notice, is like this big, like giant blue blob of starting places. That's because I made the markers too big. I can adjust them to make them smaller. So let's make them smaller. Let's make them maybe like one tenth of the original size. And that now San Francisco is a little bit smaller. You can kind of see more detail there. Cool. So let's take a look. So again, marker or circle, you can use to map a table. Just make sure your table has the right format. And now you can do all sorts of stuff. You've learned all sorts of methods to work with tables. Now you can like draw maps, put tables together, group tables together, pivot, make grids. You can do all sorts of things. Just know that you have those tools in your toolbox and practice with them. And over time, you'll be making maps and tables and Maybe you'll, be, maybe you'll be up here lecturing one day as well. I'll see you guys next week.
Thank <laughs> you.